Um, so I felt very directly called by the chair when he said he wanted us to be, uh, try and inject some optimism into our pessimism. Um, because my, my work goes under the banner of, of dark optimism um, because I find bright, shiny optimism just a bit annoying because actually everything isn't fine. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think we need to face the, the darkness that there is, honestly, but then there are plenty of good things to do with our lives in the context that we're in. Um, so Brexit was something that I found very confusing, actually. Um, I found it was the first time I'd been asked to vote on something that I didn't have a clear opinion on. Um, and I could see both sides of it. Um, I could see, on the one hand, I had an instinct towards localization, which kind of made me think, well, I don't like these globalized institutions and I want to bring control closer to home. On the other hand, I was very interested to find that almost all of my friends seemed to think it was really clear that we should stay in, the sort of lefty, greeny people, and yet they equally seem to find it very clear that Scotland should leave the UK. Um, and I was kind of interested in, in why, why that was. And I did quite a lot of reading because I didn't really know what to make of it all. And um, actually one concept I, I came up with which I found quite helpful was the concept of um, guy exit, if you will, which is something that I have a very strong opinion about. I'd quite like us to stick around on the planet. Guy exit, Gaia exit. Um, and I was sort of listening to some of the arguments that were made in the context of that, because I think the world, Gaia, has this border, in a sense, um, the border between those of us who are here now and the as yet unborn. Um, and so when I was hearing sort of Nigel Farage saying, well, we need to you know, stop people at the borders, I was thinking, well, on a global level, you know, maybe we do need to stop so many of the as yet unborn coming onto the planet. Maybe we do need to stop forcing out so many of the the residents of the planet who are already here, particularly the non-human residents who are already here in order to make space for these bloody immigrants. Um, and, uh, and then I was sort of thinking about my ecological training and thinking, well, actually, on the one hand, I can see that, to me, border controls as they are currently are just inherently racist and unjustifiable. I don't see why where you were born should give you a right to anything more than anybody else. On the other hand, Ecologically speaking, if we have unlimited movement and unlimited drains on commons, those commons are likely to be destroyed. And so I found it quite frustrating that both sides were just hurling abuse at each other and never actually dealing with the quite nuanced understanding that's necessary to, to bring together those two concepts and find you know, what might be the way forward and all of that. And then especially in the aftermath of the, of the vote, um, really troubled by the fact that people, oh, everyone who voted for Brexit was just a, a racist or an idiot. I'm like, well, no, I know people who voted out for reasons that I find perfectly respectable. And one response that I found really nourishing to the whole Brexit vote, um, drawing on what Helena was saying about listening and connecting, was there's a, there's a church in Liverpool Street called St Ethelburgers, and they held open listening days um, on the Quaker model where people could just come and say what they were feeling. And there wasn't any response. There wasn't anyone coming back and arguing with them, but just people coming and saying what they were feeling in the aftermath of the vote. And I thought that was a beautiful response to just create a space for listening and connection and, and healing this rift, which I think you know, the media are really creating this rift between as though we're two different nations, the ins and the outs, and we never the twain shall meet, and there's surely civil war on the way. So you know, that, for me, has been a, a really powerful thing to try and reconnect and integrate, as Helena was saying, ourselves as well as, um, as, well as with the wider world. And also this book, which I've been talking to lots of you about, um, by, written by my, my late mentor, David Fleming, um, which is called A Dictionary for the Future and How to Survive It. I think maybe there's one copy left back there. Um, and uh, I was quite surprised, as someone who died five years before Brexit, that he had quite a lot to say to this. Um, and I'd like to read just a few lines from his, I mean, it literally is a dictionary, and the entry on nation I thought was very pertinent. He says, a nation has an identity which connects the people who live there to a particular place and to each other. There is a landscape which many generations have shaped and defended, and there is an endowment of culture, language, and institutions which, though they can be betrayed, cannot be denied. The nation is a, lo a located, bounded, particular homeland, and if defeated, it often manages eventually to come back into being with a sense of renewal and justice. It exists in the mind of its people. 
Identity in this collective sense means that there is an identifiable meaning to the idea of we. And I, that's something I've heard a lot, especially from people who voted out, is that they felt that their identity was threatened by the EU. Like, what is it anymore to be English, to be British? And that I can understand. I think that's a, a reasonable impulse. And what I've found, I mean, I think a lot of people have identified that the majority outvote was in many ways a, a, a rejection, a no. Um, and I think in this time of, of globalization, of neoliberalism, there's a lot to reject. I think a lot of people in this age of austerity or neo-feudalism, as I call it, um, are being ground into the dirt and given an opportunity to vote on something where all the major parties agreed that you should vote in, they were like, great, I'm voting out then. Um, and I can understand that as well. But what I think is really important is in a time like this where all the unexpected election results, be it Corbyn at the Labour Party, be it Trump in America, be it Brexit, all of them seem to be rejections of the mainstream. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people have talked about the danger of fascism in these times where everyone's so disillusioned. I think it's really important to remember historically that people like Mussolini, people like Hitler, they didn't just come to power on the basis of a politics of, of fear and division. They also raised wages and they addressed unemployment and they improved working conditions. And if we're going to create a beautiful version of Brexit rather than that fearful, awful version of Brexit, then we need to lay out a vision of what the, the pro-Brexit, as some people have disgustingly started calling it, what that, what that alternative Brexit looks like, what it means to have a relocalized economy, what it means to tell a story that's different from the thing that everyone's rejecting but doesn't really know necessarily what they want instead. Um, that's why you know, it was amazing for me to be working on this book at the time it came out, because for me it really it lays out that vision of, a, of an economics built in trust and loyalty and local diversity, which is the most inspiring vision I've seen of that. So it's been a, it's been a labor of love for me over the last couple of years to, to bring it into being and, and talks about things we've heard a lot about today, the household economy and consumers and producers and the limits to economies of scale and um, alternative means of education are all, are all in here. So, um, so yeah, I'd like to um, bring some of, some of my late friend and mentor, David Fleming's wisdom into the room. And, um, and also invite you all, and uh, Helena ended on the note of celebration, which I agree is very important. Um, and actually on Wednesday coming, uh, there will be the celebration of the launch of these books um, in, uh, in Chelsea, a Daunt bookshop in Chelsea. Um, so you're all very welcome to come. It would be wonderful to see you there, because for me it will be a celebration of a culmination of many years' work. Um, as I say, I think there's actually only maybe one or no copies of this left back there, but they will, of course, be available there or, or, or online from all good bookshops that aren't Amazon. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, also, if anyone wants a discount code for a good online bookshop, let me know. Um, so, yeah, hopefully see you for a celebration on Wednesday, and in the meantime, look forward to more discussion now. Thanks. <laughs>